My name is Richard Wesley, and it's my privilege to be the pastor here at St. Bethlehem United Methodist Church. Now, I am really excited that you're with us today. Today is the second Sunday of Easter. So last Sunday, we celebrated Resurrection Sunday. Now, today's Jesus story actually begins on that first Easter that we celebrated last week, but before we complete the story, it moves into the following Sunday. This is a, a story that centers around Thomas. And we're going to see, by the time that this story ends, that Thomas has assurance that Jesus has been raised from the dead. And that's an important theme. That's what we're going to be looking at today as we look at Thomas's lack of faith. Our theme is assurance of our faith. this morning is found in the Gospel of John. One was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt. But believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The words of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. 
Were you paying attention to how today's story begins when Robert was reading it? Listen to that opening again. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After this, he said, after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Now, now first of all, it is the evening of that first Easter Sunday. And Jesus' followers are hiding in fear of the Jewish leaders who could turn them over to the Roman authorities the very same way they had Jesus arrested. They have good reason to be afraid. Rome has just crucified their um, leader using extreme violence. You see, the, the Romans demanded that the rulers in the lands they conquered keep the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. Roman peace means no political uprisings, no rebellions among the people. And in their opinion, Jesus had been a trouble rouser for the Roman government. Jesus had not been content to leave well enough alone. Jesus and his radical teachings stood in sharp contrast to the theology and the politics of Rome. And Jesus had gained the attention of the common people. As any empire understands, if the common people stand up in opposition to the rulers, those in power uh, stand to lose their prestige and their wealth. Had the Roman Empire understood Christianity when Jesus was crucified, they would have rounded up Jesus' followers and committed major resources to stamp out the Jesus movement once and for all. Of course, Rome had no way of knowing the potential of these uneducated Galileans. Rome had no comprehension of what common people filled with the power and the Spirit of God were capable of. But it was always possible for Rome to round up the followers of political dissidents and crucify them along with their leader. So, the followers of Jesus were hiding in fear of being arrested as co-conspirators of Jesus. Now, another thing we notice in this story is that Jesus shows up. Jesus, whom the government murdered by state-sanctioned execution, shows up and stands right in their presence among them. They know Jesus. They might have a challenge believing anything like this could happen, but they know this is Jesus. They recognize him. And John says, these disciples rejoice. But Thomas wasn't with them. Thomas missed one church service, and that's the one week Jesus shows up. <laughs> one of our annual conference speakers said that a few years ago. That I, I've always loved the way he put that. Uh, he said he was always afraid of missing church based on this story because it'd be just his luck. That would be the day Jesus showed up. That's what happened to, to Thomas. And this is where Thomas gets a bad rap. Do you know what Thomas is known for? Yeah, see, see some of you do. Some of you are, are thinking right now, doubting Thomas. That's right. Doubting 
Thomas. And this is a very unfortunate moniker. It leaves us with a watered down version of Thomas, falling short of what the story really says. The moniker, Doubting Thomas, also clouds over some of the really cool things that Thomas offers. For example, did you know that it was Thomas who says, Lord, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? He's also the brave one who in one of our Jesus stories realizes that Jesus could very well be killed when Jesus decides to go to, to Bethany when Lazarus dies. And it's Thomas that says to the other disciples, let's go with him that we may die with him. That's Thomas. But all of this gets pushed to the background because we remember that this is doubting Thomas. However, our story never refers to Thomas as a doubter, at least not in the original story written in the Greek language. You see, in the Greek language, uh, Greek takes a root word and then adds letters in front of uh, or behind the word to create different expressions of the word. When an alpha, the first letter of the Greek alphabet, is placed in front of a root word, it negates the word. For example, if we had the Greek word for color and we placed an alpha in front of the Greek word that means color, it would change the meaning to colorless or no color. Um, in English, we do that by adding the letters L-E-S-S -S at the end of the word. So we would say colorless. In the Greek, they add the first letter of the Greek language, the alpha, in front of the word, and it negates the word. Now, here's the problem with how we read Thomas. The Greek language has a word for doubt, one that means little faith or trusting too little. But that word is not in this story. Rather, the Greek word for faith is negated with an alpha for this story. The Greek word for faith is pistis. And so the alpha is placed in front of the uh, word pistis, and we have apistis. And it means faithless or no faith. Now, I've, I've said all of that just to say this is a story about Thomas's lack of faith, not his doubting. Thomas doesn't say, well, I doubt that. Thomas says, I don't believe that. Or I have no faith that that is true. Now, to doubt something is to say, well, I guess it could be true, but I'm not real sure. To have no faith is to say, that's not possible. Thomas has no faith that Jesus is alive. What about us? Do we have faith? Now, let me ask you, what happened in the story that caused or allowed the other followers to have faith where Thomas was left with no faith. Let's look at the story again. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Did you see it? Jesus showed them 
his hands and side, then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. These followers, disciples, recognize Jesus, but they cannot have faith for their eyes. They can't believe what they're seeing. They cannot have faith that this is Jesus because they saw him murdered by the state. They know Jesus to be dead. But when Jesus shows them the scars from the torturous crucifixion, they pistis. They have faith. They have faith. So when is it that Thomas has faith? It is when Jesus shows him the scars on his hands and his side. But I, I think the real impetus of this story goes even deeper than doubt or faith. Let's look at one last glimpse of today's story. Thomas has just been told that Jesus is alive. Thomas has replied that he has no faith. And then the, the story says, a week later, Jesus' disciples were again in the house. And this time Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then Jesus said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not apistus. That's the Greek word. The word pistis, faith, with the alpha in front of it. Do not be without faith, is what Jesus is telling Thomas. But, pistis, have faith. Thomas, look at my scars. Don't be without faith. Thomas, have faith. And Thomas's response is to answer Jesus, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to Philip, Oh, I'm sorry, to Thomas. Have you experienced faith because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have come to faith. My Lord and my God. Now, by the way, It'll take the church 200 more years before Christians begin to look at Jesus as God. Thomas claims Jesus is God in today's story. It'll be the year 325 before the church catches up with Thomas. But the, the real story for today, I believe, is how the disciples and Thomas came to faith. None of them, the disciples included, had faith after the crucifixion until they saw the scars in Jesus' hand and Jesus' side. That's what our story just told us. So let me ask you, when did you come to have faith? Faith is not a mental exercise of what we call believing. Faith is an assurance that this is true. Have you seen the scars in Jesus' hands and sides? Yeah. I haven't either. So, Jesus says to Thomas, now a man of faith, have you come to faith because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to faith. So, reaching out 2,000 years, Jesus says, Blessed are you who have not seen and yet have come to faith. That's you. That's you. How has...
Christianity survived for 2,000 years when no one has seen Jesus, no one has seen those scars, no one saw the side or his hands. Well, for 2,000 years, Christianity has spread primarily through relationships. The most significant relationships have been parents or grandparents. I'm guessing that most of you learned about Jesus from your parents and grandparents. So did I. The second most common way is through trusted friendships. You know, even missionaries learned that they would not be successful in introducing people to Jesus until they built trusting relationships with the people that they were trying to influence for Jesus. You probably see where I'm going with this, don't you? We're talking about assurance of faith. Do you have assurance of your faith? Now, after a while, we're going to sing, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Do you have that blessed assurance? Are you sure in your faith? You see, people who are sure live the life Jesus taught us to live. And people who live the life Jesus taught us to live are people with assurance. Which comes first? It's a chicken or egg question. If you consider yourself a Christian but have no assurance, begin today living the life, actively, purposefully living the life that Jesus taught us to live. And you will live into assurance. If you're living the life Jesus taught us to live, you are growing in assurance. Now, this, this is important. It's important because you are the only Jesus people see. The disciples, including Thomas, saw Jesus' scars and they believed. Well, guess what? You have scars. If you are living the life Jesus taught, you have scars. But you continue in the midst of all of that to love. You continue to have patience. You continue to see the best in people and speak the good and the positive. That's because you are a person of faith purposefully actively living into your faith the life Jesus taught us to live. For 2,000 years, people have been attracted to people of faith who are genuine, and people still are. When you love people, and, and I mean genuinely love people, they're attracted to you. They want to know, why would you accept them when others won't? You know, one reason churches are in decline today is because we've stopped loving those who are not like us. We have stopped being the people Jesus calls us to be. The call of Easter is a call to have faith. To have faith is to live the life of loving our enemies, non-judgmental acceptance of those who are different from us. To have faith and live into your faith is to place yourself in the path of people who do not yet know the love that only a person of faith like you 
can offer them. Let us pray. Blessed are you, Lord, God of creation. As you are one, so have you knit together your people as one and blessed them. You have commanded the blessing of life forevermore through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In singing our praises, praises to your blessed name, we give you thanks. You have loved us with an eternal love but we have not always returned it. You give us life in your law, but we do not always obey. You present your faithful promises in the word made flesh, but we do not believe. We doubt, and we ask for further proofs. For our negligence, for our disobedience, for our unbelief, forgive us, good Lord. Help us to understand in new ways your power as revealed in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. The message we have received is that you are the light which takes away the darkness and shows us the way of life. So fill us with the light of your Holy Spirit that we may have fellowship with one another and testify to what we have received that all the world may be brought to, to, to the truth. Your people, the church, have been called to be of one heart and soul. We remember that we are one with our brothers and sisters who are in distress because of the suffering in body, mind, and spirit. Be with us and with them that your comforting touch may be felt and we all may be made whole. Bless us who have not seen yet, but yet believe in him who died and rose for us, and who's it, in whose name we pray, Jesus Christ the Lord. And now, join me in praying the prayer that he has taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
have assurance that you are a child of God. You know, a good place to begin to explore that in your life if you have questions is to actively live the life Jesus taught us to live. Actively, purposefully. Examine your actions. Not just your actions, but your motives behind your actions. Why do you really love and care for these folks and these folks you don't like so much? Jesus said, love your enemies. Not just the folks that we want to love and like. A good place to begin. Purposefully, actively, intentionally, Live the life of love that Jesus calls us to. We'll see you next week.